the work you do at the International Red Cross is really about basic humanity. It's helping, assisting and protecting people in the worst of circumstances in war, violence and conflict. When hope is dwindling away, when hope is evaporating and there the International Committee is there really to re-inject a perspective to people and communities. Uh, listening to the perspective, the insecurity of all those women who wonder where their men and sons are, who went to war, separated families, uh, the insecurity of those who know that their relatives are somewhere in detention or not knowing whether they died or not. And so I have legends of stories which all of them are enormously impressive and also very frankly shake you as a person because it's dramatic uh, lives and livelihoods with which you are confronted. Individualized uh, perspectives are certainly important but they are not durable and therefore I would recommend that whatever you do as an individual to have a satisfying life needs also to be mirrored by your compassion and solidarity and engagement with others. Welcome to The Best Advice, learning from thinkers and doers. I'm Frank Arnold. With my guests, I talk about extraordinary achievements, the best advice my guest ever got, as well as stories and insights from a successful life. I like to get a behind-the-scenes look at an interesting organization and learn something from my guests. If you too are interested in these inspiring personalities and would like to learn something from them, you're more than welcome. My guest today is Peter Maurer. Peter Maurer is president of the International Committee of the Red Cross. He was appointed in 2012. Under his leadership, the ICRC carried out humanitarian work in over 80 countries. As president, Mr. Maurer has a unique exposure to today's main armed conflicts and the challenges of assisting and protecting people in need. He travels regularly to the major conflict theaters of the world, including Syria, Iraq, Yemen, South Sudan and Myanmar. As the ICR's chief diplomat and through the ICR's principled neutral approach, Mr. Maurer regularly meets with heads of states, other high-level officials, as well as parties to conflict to find solutions to pressing humanitarian concerns. Mr. Maurer has served as Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs in Switzerland, as well as the Ambassador and the Permanent Representative of Switzerland to the United Nations in New York. We talk about his big current challenges, his very broad scope of work, and how listeners and I can support the work of the Red Cross. Ask him what was surprised him most in the last two years and what new habits and beliefs he has adopted during this time. And of course, I asked him what was the best advice he ever got. Please enjoy the video and podcast, The Best Advice, Learning from Thinkers and Doers. Peter, thank you so much for taking the time and being here. Thanks for having me today. My first question is, how did you get started with the International Red Cross? Well, I, come, I came to the International Red Cross after, after 25 years in the Swiss diplomatic service. And you don't get started by applying to the Red Cross. I was asked whether I was interested to be the next president of the International Red Cross. That is a sort of a by appointment uh, position. And this is how I entered a new world from diplomacy. On the other hand, as a Swiss diplomat, of course, you know throughout the 25 years, you know what the International Red Cross is. You have seen them in the field. You have seen them as partners for the development of international law. You have seen them acting in the international arena. So uh, it's not unfamiliar territory, but it was a new and a big step to go from representing the interest of a state to representing kind of a global public good. 
uh, with uh, the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, which is the guardian of the Geneva Conventions of International Law. And therefore, uh, it was quite a shift. And what fascinates you about the organization most? I think two things when I reflected whether I should take the job or not, uh, relevance and impact were, at the end of the day, the two words which draw me to the conclusion that I should accept to be the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Relevance because the work you do at the International Red Cross is really about basic humanity. It's helping, assisting and protecting people in the worst of circumstances, in war, violence and conflict. When hope is uh, dwindling away, when hope is evaporating, and there the International Committee is there really to re-inject a perspective to people and communities. So you deal with an issue which is relevant. And the second thing, after 25 years in diplomacy where you are just one row in a big machinery. As a president of the ICRC, you are with an organization which has immediate impact because humanitarianism is about emergency, is, is about immediacy. Uh, when there is a, a big crisis, when there is war uh, going on, hundreds of thousands fleeing, you have to be there the next day. And the feeling of working for an organization which has an immediacy of impact is what fascinated me. And with your very large scope of the work that you're dealing with, could you give us an overview of the most relevant topics for your personal work? Indeed, as you rightly say, the world of assisting people in conflict and war is on the one side abroad because still in the world, unfortunately, uh, we are confronted with tens of active conflict and uh, probably 100 situations around the world in which people live in miserable conditions because of predominant violence. If I look at the focuses, unsurprisingly, you will find that Africa is still the continent in which ICRC has the strongest focus of operations, 45% of everything we do, 45% of our staff and of our resources are in Africa. Another 33% in the Middle East, unsurprisingly after the, uh, after, uh, the Arab Spring uh, in 2011-12, uh, in we saw uh, an increase of conflictuality in that, reason, in that region and that makes the difference. And all the others are kind of outliers, not that they are not as important as those two regions, but we are active from the southern Philippines to Myanmar, to Afghanistan, to Ukraine, uh, but then also uh, in Latin America, some Central American countries, Venezuela, Colombia. This adds to the operations in Africa, which uh, still uh, is the largest chunk of our work. If I look at themes, it's really the respect for international law, it's mounting operations of assistance, and it's very frankly also defending humanitarianism in the international arena. That's what I call humanitarian diplomacy, and for which as a president I carry and I bear responsibility. You mentioned hope in an earlier question. How do you go about it personally, that you do not lose hope in the situations that you have to face? It's an interesting spin, I have to tell you, because it's a question I am very often confronted. And when you see me in the media, I'm most of the time in situations where looking from afar, you think it can't get worse because these are the mi most miserable places. It's the bombed cities of Syria. Uh, it's the desperate refugee camps in Africa. It's what you see is indeed desperate. What m makes me keep hope is maybe two things. 
first to see that with relatively few resources you can make big steps forward for the people affected. It doesn't need tons of money compared to what the international community otherwise spends in order to give back a perspective to people, to make water run again, to have some basic food or livelihood assistance, to treat uh, people of their uh, wounds and, and to offer them basic health services. It doesn't need a lot and with the relatively few resources you can inject normalcy again into very difficult lives. But there is a second element of hope which uh, is actually the people themselves who are the worst affected. And, and here this is maybe the biggest surprise I have had when I came from diplomacy for a state to humanitarianism represented by the ICRC. Uh, it is impressive how resilient people and communities are and how those worst affected are most of the time those who are the most hopeful people in terms of injecting a perspective for the future. They want to get on with their lives and their willingness their strength to move out of the difficulties in which they are is what encourages me always. Contrary to expectations in our societies and sometimes to certain political circles in Europe and beyond who think that these people are just waiting for handouts, that's not true. All the beneficiaries I meet are beneficiaries which want to be helped in order to help themselves. They want to move on with their lives and they have an enormous strength which injects me hope for those communities. The way you speak about these people, it seems that you have experienced, that you have experienced stories. Do you have a story in mind or a situation where you experienced a person? Well, I have, of course, after nine years in the job, I have hundreds of stories because I made it a little bit a program of my presidency. Not only to have an organization which is close to people, proximity is kind of the, the key principle of our work. I wanted to understand what happens at the front line of conflicts and violence and victimization of society. And that's the reason why I took many hours and many days to sit down uh, in the middle of the desert, in the middle of refugee camp and to listen. And here I could speak of, of Syria during the worst of combat operations, feeling what it means to be under artillery fire, uh, to try to get on with your life when war doesn't stop, uh, listening to the perspective, the insecurity of all those women who wonder where their men and sons are, who went to war, separated families, uh, the insecurity of those who know that their relatives are somewhere in detention or not knowing whether they died or not. And so I have legends of stories which all of them are enormously impressive and also very frankly shake you as a person because it's dramatic uh, lives and livelihoods with which you are confronted. How do you handle these enormous expectations that these people place in you, the hope that they place in you when they talk to you personally? How do you deal with that, those expectations that you do not have to leave with a feeling that you will have to disappoint them? Well, the, uh, I think there is the famous word on uh, walking the talk and, and, and I think not overselling what you are doing. And sometimes we underestimate or we overestimate the expectations very often I have seen that what is important is 
really time is to sit down and listen. And sitting down and listen and not necessarily wanting to find the solution immediately or pretending that you are find, finding the solution immediately is of critical importance. There is nothing worse than those humanitarians and development representatives who come to contexts in which they work and pretend that they sell the El Dorado. And I think people are not stupid. They know that you can't really make uh, go the war go away. But I think genuinely listening, trying to understand, trying to respond what is the most pressing, taking the time to engage with communities, and not trying to sell a prefabricated idea of help is, I think, what gives credibility to an organization. Too often, I still see that responses to crises are designed in air-conditioned offices uh, somewhere in big capitals. And that's not what, at the end of the day, has a good impact. I think we increasingly come to the conclusion that the best is really to take time to listen and then to design responses together with those affected from violence and conflict. And then you find sometimes responses which are very different. And this dynamic and understanding this dynamic, I think, is important not to disappoint those who are you are supposed uh, to assist, protect. And how can <coughs> individuals or organizations support your cause? I think the easy answer would be by offering us resources, and this is financial resources first and foremost, and we appreciate everybody who can spare some money in order to help us do what we do. We are a professional organization and we want to spend money professionally. But there is another story to that and over the last couple of years we really were looking also for partnership with organizations who have knowledge, experience and expertise to offer to us in order to solve some of the intrinsic problems with which we are confronted. How do you bring electricity to refugee camps? Uh, partnering with <coughs> a multinational enterprise who investigate, ha has research in, uh, in mini grids is of critical importance. Seeing how we solve the energy problem by bringing solar panels uh, into uh, humanitarian operations is of critical importance. Partnering with medical institutions to see how can we design the operation theater, the hospital, which is deployable uh, in very difficult circumstances. These are all innovative processes which come from cooperation with the private sector, with companies. We may be the most famous example I can tell you and the recent example is that we have developed with the private sector a new prosthesis, a new prosthetic foot which we are deploying in all our physical rehabilitation centers around the world and which is way better than what we did before and gives much more agility to and mobility to those who have lost uh, legs and arms and this is one of the examples where partnership with the private sector and innovation uh, for innovation in humanitarian work is something which uh, really is an important help we can have. And if you are working in an organization in the, pri in the private sector, if you are in research, if you are interested in innovation, that's uh, what you can push for also to have your company partner with uh, an expert humanitarian organization like ours. And then there is the whole financial sector which is sometimes forgotten. But today with the 
uh, immateriality of the world also spreading in crisis theater, we don't necessarily transport assistance from A to B. We also transfer money. Uh, in many places of the world, people have cell phones. They are poor, they are dependent on humanitarian assistance, they are uh, in conflict situations, but they have a cell phone. So all the innovative tools for safe money transfer, for safe data hosting and for data protection services in conflict situation. These are all new developments in humanitarian assistance where the support of individuals and companies is of critical importance. Um, <coughs> let's, let me go back to the topic of knowledge. Where would it be most useful for you to have additional partnerships or additional knowledge? If you would have a wish, <coughs> wish list. If I had a, a wish list, I would uh, really go through the whole bandwidth of activities, but I can focus. It is obvious that health, water and sanitation, shelter are uh, the fundamentals which you have to have at the best possible, fastest and most deployable and effi effective and efficient way in order to run an emergency operations. But then you have other types. Uh, we have to be conscious that humanitarian needs are transforming. Today, for instance, mental health and trauma science is of critical importance. And therefore, mental health specialists and innovation, how do you deal with a society which is heavily traumatized and there is one psychiatrist? Uh, how do you scale and how do you use modern technology in order to get in touch with people? How do you deal with those intrinsic issues? I think that's an important, uh, uh, an important element. I mentioned uh, the financial services, which is absolutely, absolutely critical today to bring financial services, data protection, is something which is of critical importance. We work in situations which are highly security sensitive. Your personal data are on the one side entitling you to get humanitarian assistance, on the other hand it can make you an object of attack because you are working in very war-torn and tenacious societies. So you could go through the whole value chain of creating a humanitarian work and in critical moments you see that there are hooks and links to what our societies offer uh, through the private sector and market economy. And I really encourage all young startups, uh, engaged uh, next generation executives to think about adding value to a traditional line of work which badly needs, uh, needs innovation, new methodology, new technologies. You mentioned digitalization and you also have taken a very strong effort in digitalizing your own organization. Would you like to elaborate a bit on that? Well, it is indeed uh, 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 one of the big challenges of today's world. Everything is, every aspect of life is transforming and unsurprisingly the oldest sort of international work, humanitarian work uh, done in the last 160 years by my organization is also digitalizing. And, and I think we, we realized very early on in, in 2012, 13, 14 that we needed uh, to change gear. And that's where we built our backbone digital operations. We capacitated uh, the organization and everybody working in the organization to really go digital and put on uh, digital, uh, on, uh, on digital uh, tools at their work and to think about digitalizing the services to people. Uh, we are today, uh, after 
10 years of effort, I think we have accomplished quite a lot. We are certainly not there yet. It remains a complex enterprise, but I think we come slowly to a completion of digitalization as the backbone of an organization ready to do it is, is basically about to be completed. And now we are focusing much more on digitalizing services, seeing how we can become the trusted host of data for people. We are rolling out at the present moment a, uh, a new tool in which people can deposit their personal data and their personal identity documents on a trusted and safe server. And this will help them circumvent exploitation by traffickers. It will change the ball game. And I would have hundreds of examples now where we move from physical, traditional services into digitally, digital or digitally supported uh, services. And this is a big enterprise. Uh, in particular, that the humanitarian sector is not naturally inclined to go into that direction, but it is a great advantage uh, if you do. It is very interesting. Could you uh, elaborate on a couple more projects in this direction? Well, you see, uh, uh, if you look, for instance, at analytics, uh, one of the critical issue today is to target your assistance to the people and the places in which the biggest needs are. Uh, satellite imagery allows you to have a much closer and better knowledge on where your people are and what needs are. Uh, big data analytics is something which today allows us to do foresight on humanitarian needs emerging and to be much faster in the response. I mentioned financial transactions. Uh, so I do believe that we are really in a critical phase. And COVID-19 has now dramatically uh, accelerated the digitalization project, because suddenly a lot of physical contacts and assistance processes which were in place could not be continued. Uh, distancing needed investment into digital services to communicate. Within a very short period, we have internally expanded our connectivity and we have expanded connectivity to people. If you can't go to people, at least talk virtually to them. And while the digital divide today remains an issue in some of the contexts, you would be surprised from Mali to Niger to Burkina Faso to Somalia to Afghanistan, how connected many of these places are and how much it is possible today to replace and substitute person-to-person -person contact, at least temporarily, with uh, digital, with virtual contacts, uh, creating platforms, creating engagement. If you can't bring aid to the people, let's at least come people on, uh, on the virtual platforms to get instructions, to get trainings, uh, to get help how to repair a water pump uh, or a solar panel. And these are dramatically new developments which fundamentally change uh, the work we are doing. And you see, I hear sometimes critical notions that humanity is lost in that. And we all know the feelings because we have, as people in societies like European and Swiss society, we felt what it means suddenly to stay home and to go digital. And there is a problem uh, indeed. But I'm still surprised how important it is to virtualize the world to create virtual capacities, to virtual services, and in that sense to com 
to complement what we have done physical with what is going on in the virtual world. And as in many other societies of the world, humanitarian contexts are now different. We are all somehow looking for a new mix of hybrid work and hybrid interaction. We don't know yet where the cursor will be, but we need humane person-to-person -person contacts on the one side. And on the other hand, we need to take best advantage of the digital possibility that new tools offer to us in order to more effectively and efficiently assist and protect populations in need. And this mix is the big challenge we are looking at. I would be curious to know what surprised you most in the last 12 months? Maybe the speed with which we all adapted to virtual. Uh, maybe the penetration which I saw in some of the re most remote places of the world in which digital has already arrived. I think the illustration in many places that digital is not just a tool which accelerates what we are doing. It is a fundamental transformer. I think the example I, I alluded to before is a, is a good one with trying to position my organization as a host for personal data. We see that when your identity is not a physical document, but is a virtual document which is safely deposited and you can draw on it wherever you are, you basically take away the business line of traffickers. Traffickers can't blackmail you because and take away your passport in order to blackmail you. If you are safely st have safely stored your document, you are in a new ball game. And I think this transformatory force and the speed with which the transformatory force has touched our work, the societies in which we work, has touched the international community, uh, I wouldn't have thought that we would be so fast. Honestly, Frank, we have also seen a little bit the backlash. People got fed up and got afraid of the transformation. And we have all the psychosocial problems that we are carrying in our societies, in the societies in which we work, and which we should not neglect. Uh, people got mentally fragile because they were working at home. They got disconnected, they were got depressive because of lockdowns and and so big challenges are still there. They got overpowered by the speed and force of the transformation. But I think that's what has surprised me most. Maybe a last thing a little bit more political. Uh, you see, during the first lockdown I was also amongst those who thought because the pandemic would touch everybody that we would get more integrated responses. And I have been disappointed and surprised at the same time how much we have added inequities in our societies and worldwide. Vaccines is a good example. I mean, every country put all the resources they had, and if you, if you don't have resources, you can't, into vaccinating uh, its population. And the fact that 99% of all the vaccines are still in relatively well-off countries and only 1% in the 100 countries who have difficulties either uh, developmental or because of conflict is a big issue, which uh, uh, is a transformatory force, is a big risk into the future, 
and a big preoccupation and probably a surprise that we didn't manage and international community and societies didn't manage to have more equitable approaches. And what would be your wish and how could one support your cause? Well, I think uh, symbolically and practically uh, it is important that these deep inequities are narrowed. We need to be able to, again, to go back to basics. Back to basics is provide basic health services to people in need. And it is unacceptable that millions, billions, trillions are spent just for those who have and that no services are offered to others. And I think we need a fundamental shift in society in how we generate uh, resources, how we generate basic social services, how we finance those so social services. Otherwise, we will go in a world with much more conflictuality. And so that's a political issue. Huh? We, you can certainly, as, a, as an individual, as a company, you can work, as I have tried to illustrate, to narrow the gap. But at the end of the day, you need laws, you need policies, you need international agreements. And this is an issue which needs political action. You need, as a citizen, to express yourself and to work towards policies which are less unequal and which offer better perspectives to people. I think I'm really disturbed and irritated at the present moment that we are creating frustrations in many parts of the world because of the inequitable policies. So my call for people listening into uh, your podcast, Frank, is, is really to go beyond technical and technocratic approaches to solving problems. It is critically important that we are professional and we try to do the best we can as individuals to solve problems. But we need societal and political engagement to change the course of where we are heading. And this is true for the impact of COVID. It is true for climate change. We need to change behavior. You, we need to change policies. And this needs a collective political action and not only uh, technical knowledge and professionalism. You just mentioned a topic I also wanted to ask you about, the topic of sustainability and climate change. You're very engaged in those topics. And I was wondering if you could please elaborate a bit on what you do with the Red Cross in the field and what you do with the Red Cross internally on the subject of sustainability. Maybe I should start in, in saying that for many decades, uh, humanitarians, because of scarce resources and big needs, have always gone for the cheapest solutions offered to the biggest number. Mm -hmm. If y you are in an emergency, you have 500,000 people displaced, you go, you, you try to do the best with the buck. And that's where humanitarians traditionally were. Till we realized, of course, that climate change and environmental degradation is such a threat to society, is such a driver of violence, is such a driver of conflict and tensions in societies, that we needed to be examples ourselves to go sustainable. And that's the reason why we uh, created a big sustainability program, looking at, at our own operation, looking at energy consumption, at sustainable goods that we are distributing, quality management became much more important. And I think looking at where we are at the present moment, we are still at the beginning of this fundamental transformation where value for money means something different than 10 years ago. Uh, we need to look into the sustainability 
into the health impact of what we are doing, into the overall environmental impact. And I think it's of critical importance that we, do, uh, we reduce our carbon footprint. We increase the quality of what we have, and here the big dilemma start. Uh, in order to do the transformation, an environmentally friendly transformation, we need also more resources, and more resources are not available for many of the con contexts in which we work. Contrary to our society where being green is first a fashion and certainly something which most of us can afford. We can buy the car electrical and we can buy the goods sustainable. But offering this option over time in humanitarian operations is a big issue and that's the reason why we are engaging in this fundamental overhaul process which starts with energy. In many of the countries of the world we see that uh, these are countries with an enormous potential for solar energy. We have transformed some countries 100% into solar at, at the moment. We will go into other contexts and uh, hopefully be able in a couple of years to show to donors that we are have substantively reduced carbon footprint. Uh, other aspects, uh, the sort of uh, supply chain of goods and durability and sustainability of, uh, sustainability of goods will probably be more dependent on markets and innovations and prices being offered to a humanitarian organization. But we are conscious today that Conflicts are not just conflicts. There is an intrinsic link between climate change, underdevelopment, conflict and violence, and we need to cut uh, that negative dynamic that has established itself in so many contexts. You go to the Sahel today, everybody agrees that at the origin of violence is climate change. Is changing rainfall patterns uh, is uh, uncontrolled migration, is tension over surfaces, over arable land. And all these dynamics and logics have to be somehow countered. And you can only do it when you have a solid institutional problem uh, p policy of going green. And if your products are increasingly environmentally compatible. Another topic I wanted to ask you about is the topic of gender equality, a topic you strongly support in your work. Could you please explain a bit what you're doing with the Red Cross in this field? I think there are two aspects again. There is an internal aspect. Uh, if I look at our organization, at the Red Cross movement at large, I think there is no question that we have embarked for a long time in an effort to go to 50-50. We are not there, but at certain levels of hierarchy we manage. We manage to be relatively good at recruitment. We manage to be relatively good at executive level and as all other organizations <laughs> as well, we struggle in between. But I think the track record shows improvement and I think there is no alternative than having very solid monitoring, uh, very sort of precise objectives from one year to another in order to go to 50-50. That's gender. But then let's look a little bit broader. Internally as well as what we are and what we want to be in the places in which we operate. It is obvious that the Red Cross and the ICRC cannot be the sort of Swiss organization full of Swiss which travels the world. I think we are active in diverse societies which have knowledge, aspirations. We are in the meantime 18,000 staff out of 135 or 36 nationalities. Uh, we 
need to have a policy of diversity which gives perspectives independently on your passport. And this is not only an imperative to be an attractive employer, it's even more an imperative to be a good humanitarian operator. You can't really operate in the context in which we are if you come as the white man coming to those conf contexts. You need to listen to people, as I have illustrated. You need, need to listen to your staff. You need to embrace diversity in order to be able to be a good operator in the diverse environment in which we are operating. We have invested massively to also train, educate, promote, and bring more diversified negotiating teams into our frontline operations. We know that diversified teams negotiate better deals than just male outsiders and internationals, which is the culture and the tradition in many places still. So there is a lot still to do. I think today we are in a place as many organizations are. We recognize the importance, we have started the journey, but we are not yet there. Let's take a look into the future. What are the next big projects for you personally? I feel very honored that you've taken the time today, as we're only two days after the collapse of Kabul. What are your next immediate projects? Well, there is an immediate project and there are developments of strategic importance. The immediate projects in humanitarianism, they come to you with the surprises the international system has to offer. <laughs> and <laughs> Afghanistan <laughs> is one of them, even if ICRC for more than 30 years has been there. It's one of our largest operations. We have more than 1,800 staff in the country. It's one of our top five in terms of budget in the world. And an implosion of a political system, as we have seen over the last couple of days, challenges massively this operation. You lack suddenly interlocutors. Uh, you need to rearrange. You need to see how you can secure your operation. You have to find consensus with the new political authorities. This is facilitated by the fact that ICRC has traditionally talked to all sides. The new government emerging now and governance emerging in Kabul uh, is not having very different faces that we wouldn't know. Uh, but still, I mean, developments of this speed need a lot of attention, need a lot of care, need a lot of solid positioning as a neutral and impartial organization, needs us to be able to mobilize the global networks that we have and to securitize so that our operation can continue. We ordered our people to stay. Uh, we try to keep uh, and maintain our delivery of services to the Afghan people. That's the top priority we have. And then in the next few days, it is really do new needs assessment, see what these developments cause as humanitarian necessities and then try to respond. And what I can foresee is that we will have to quite substantively increase our assistance operation in Afghanistan. Strategically, I think, Frank, we have touched in this conversation on the big transformations we are looking at. For me, the top priority remains the same as it has been for the organization for 160 years. The objective is still to assist and protect people affected by war and violence in the best possible way. But the way we are able to do that, the methods, the environment in which we are able to do that needs adaptation. It needs partnership with others, in particular with the private sector, with the development actors, with the international institutions. It needs digital transformation of your own organization and the services. 
it needs more care and cautious for the environmental impact. It needs more diversity, uh, as you have mentioned, more uh, sensitivity on what the specificity of local action is and how you can support. So we are in a big transformation of the humanitarian world and we can only do it if we have solid support from the broader societies in donor countries, in countries like Switzerland, who is our host country, but also in the places in which we operate. Mm -hmm. As a closing, may I ask you a couple of personal questions? And one question I had on my mind was, are there any new beliefs or new habits that you have adopted in the last two to three years that have fundamentally changed the way you work or the way you look at things? Well, habits definitely. Uh, I would never have thought that the digital transformation of my work that I would experience that. Uh, I always thought digital transformation is something I work for because I, I'm convinced that it will be important, but I would never have thought that I sit in my office or at home and I have conversations with foreign ministers, ministers of defense, chief of staff of armed forces to negotiate uh, humanitarian access or a humanitarian space for my organization. So it fundamentally changed habits and, and, and I think it moved the cursor and I would say personally as well, I'm still looking for the best mix of virtual and personal. Beliefs, uh, look, uh, it's this strong belief that we live in an extraordinary period of extraordinary transformation. And I think I have become even more cautious than before, and I was already cautious, to believe that what is today is there tomorrow as well. That's probably not the case. <laughs> and this sentiment of volatility, of uh, things changing, needing to take another perspective, and the experience of a globalized world in which the other perspective is next door, that's, I think, what changes the way you look at things. And then my third aspect, and we haven't spoken a lot about it, but I think with the virtuality and rapid communication over platforms, the issue of right and wrong, of truth and lie, have become much more dominant. There is so much trash in that virtual space. But trash comes at you as truth. And I think one of these big challenges is that you really are fundamentally insecure in many instances today what is fake and what is real. And that changes the way you look at life and work. You have to be much more cautious. Is what comes to you really happening? Or is it staged? Or is it faked? And the whole issue of misinformation, disinformation, fake news is a predominant reality today. And I think we are far from having really developed the instincts and the knowledge to deal with these uh, new realities. But it is an important one. It has always been with us. Huh? Wars are the graveyards of truth. And we knew that when we are in war, all the liars are out. And to experience today that this has become a global reality. Mm 
it's not lying in the middle of a country which is in conflict is global lies mm -hmm. and global truth and what is real and not real which is uh, such an important shift. Is this also what you're most worried about or may I ask what are you most worried about and as a follow-up question what are you optimistic about? Well indeed uh, th I mean when there is this big insecurity and volatility in society about what is right and wrong, truth and lies, then this is basically only an indicator of the difficulties of building consensus in society. And the worry is, of course, that because of these situations, dynamics, that we will have to invest much more in trying to find consensus what is true and wrong. And of course, we, do, we don't necessarily take that time. We pretend not to have it, but I'm deeply convinced that we, it will be forced upon us. Uh, building a new consensus in societies on some of the fundamentals is, I think, what I'm worried, but what I'm also hopeful that eventually we will be able to do it. And we do have to represent it as an institution because the Geneva Conventions are basically the fundamental constitution of minimal ethical behavior in worst of circumstances. And therefore, in volatile situations like this one, we have to invest again into finding consensus. What is acceptable behavior in society? What is acceptable and what is non-acceptable? And this is, I think, a big responsibility. It can generate around humanitarian work. It can be done around other work. But I think it is important that we are conscious about the fragmented dividedness of the global arena, of societies today, and the importance to re-inject efforts for consensus building, for norms building, for principles which guide our societies. My last question is, of course, um, what was the best advice that you have ever got? Well, I think one of the best advice is I got a lot of good advice uh, in, uh, in my uh, in my career. I think uh, the best advice is around critical thinking. I think there is no way around today than always to put an additional second and third question, whether what is in front of you is what it looks like, what it seems, or whether it is something else. And I think the best advice I got is really to always ask, is what I see what it seems, or is there something else? Uh, looking behind is, I think, what inspires me each and every day, what I learned from my teachers uh, early on, and what has guided uh, me and what is particularly useful in the present context. And with your experience from your work and with your age and all that you've seen, is there an advice that you would pass on to the next generation? Well, uh, my sense is uh, keep society and keep the consensus in society in the picture. I'm really worried about the individualization and fragmentation of our societies and of world politics. Uh, I think I would give advice today that one of the biggest issues is indeed to develop empathy for the next generation. We need 
to re-establish a, 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 a fabric of society which allows us to survive and to be a society. Individualized uh, perspectives are certainly important, but they are not durable. And therefore, I would recommend that whatever you do as an individual to have a satisfying life needs also to be mirrored by your compassion and solidarity and engagement with others. Peter, thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm very much looking forward to our next conversations. Thanks a lot, Frank. Thank you so much and talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you for your interest. If you want to support us, subscribe to the channel. It helps us a lot to attract fascinating guests. And of course, my guests and I are very happy about positive feedback and comments. If you enjoyed the podcast or the video, please share it with friends and family. Thank you. Until the next episode, all the best.